Uh, we've heard over the last uh, day and a half or so, certainly in yesterday afternoon sessions, a lot about how technology is changing and shaping the world, uh, especially the industry, the restaurant industry here, uh, and those of us affected by that. Um, I think when we think about the depth and the breadth of the technology we've been discussing, uh, you know, it sort of comes through that it's a complicated process. There's so much out there. There's so much new coming out every day, and the pace of change is so high that you're constantly being impinged on the next thing to look at, the next new idea, the next refresh of your older ideas. Um, and that technology selection process and the sophistication of how you execute on that process is, is pretty complicated. So today we're going to talk a bit about what that selection process looks like, what the journey is as you kind of look at what's in the space, what's available, and how it applies to you. Uh, and then think about that in terms of a broader restaurant stack. We're trying to put together an idea here, a framework. We can look about these things in a structured way and communicate with each other in a sort of uh, with a model against us so that we can talk about things in the same way, look at the comparisons and the contrast the same way, and communicate our expectations and desires in the same way. Um, and to help us with that discussion today, we have, as I said, two established and very successful people in the field of uh, restaurant technology uh, to share their experiences and maybe hopefully some of their uh, insights and guidance. Uh, Tammy and Lou, Tammy from La Duff America and Lou from Red Lobster. Uh, Tammy, if you could introduce yourself first, Lou, you can go second. Yep, Please. thank you. Um, I've been leading technology for restaurant companies for uh, over 22 years, so um, definitely been around through many evolutions and iterations and um, started uh, with the TGI Fridays team in 96 when we were building everything. Some of you guys have been in the industry that long. You remember we wrote our own back office. We wrote our own payroll systems. We built a kitchen system, I think, before there was a such thing as a bump bar for sale. Um, and I've had the privilege of running IT for Applebee's um, Potbelly uh, before it was publicly traded. And um, most recently, Main Event Entertainment and La Duff America. And multi-brands, multi-systems, and it seems like uh, 22 years later, we're still doing a lot of uh, core transformation, you know, of how do you get the, the, tech, the tech stack rebuilt and ready for fast innovation and fast growth. So uh, definitely um, hope, hope to uh, share with you guys today some of the most recent um, experiences of completely transforming the tech stack to try to be ready for some of this really great innovation. Cool. Thank you. Well, my name's Lou Grandy. Um, I lead the IT team at Red Lobster. I've been around restaurants uh, all my life. I started in operations back before I graduated high school. So I know, I've, I know what it's like to be in the restaurant as an operator and um, worked my way through college and some IT consulting gigs and got back into industry in 96. Um, so I worked at AFC in the, in the 90s. We had Churches and Popeye's Chicken, um, bought Cinnabon and, and Seattle Coffee while I was there. Then I led the IT team at Rare Hospitality through the growth, growth years of 2000 to 2008 with uh, Longhorn and Capital Grill primarily. Um, then Darden acquired our concept in, uh, concepts in 2007. Left the industry in 2008, did a little entrepreneurial stuff during 08, 9, 10, 11 when things were crashing. and uh, and fortunately got back in the industry in, in 2014 um, to, uh, to lead the separation of Red Lobster from Darden. Um, so the last four years as a, a leading uh, the, the Darden team, um, it's been very interesting uh, what's happening in, in our industry and I'm looking forward to sharing some of my thoughts uh, as well. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, and then the third person on the panel is Tim Tang. Tim was the uh, driving force behind this uh, tech stack framework. Uh, and I'd like to give him a chance to introduce himself and talk a bit about where this tech stack came from and sort of where we're hoping to take it. Because you're seeing it sort of for the first time. We're just in the process of fleshing it out. We're sharing an early look with you guys. So Tim, you want to kind of talk about where we are and where we're going? Uh, sure. My name is Tim Tang. I've been with Hughes. I've been with Hughes for 24 years. I have a, a, a pretty uh, interesting role. 
My role is to look at the digital transformation of industries. In addition to looking at the restaurant industry, I've been looking at retail, uh, banking and finance, retail petroleum, and looking at how technology has basically transformed all these different industries. And there's a lot of common themes that keep coming and reoccurring in terms of customer experience, employee engagement, the use of mobile, and, and the newer technologies. And so a lot of what I'm doing is trying to understand how is technology transforming the industries, and then how can we get ahead of and take learnings from the different industries and apply them uh, appropriately. Great, thanks Tim. Uh, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is just expose the tech stack for the first time. It, uh, like I said, there's a lot that goes on in the background here. We're gonna flush out each section, but this is our, our going in position is there's, you know, traditionally the front of house, back of house areas. Uh, back house actually has two distinct areas we're gonna talk about as we flesh this out. Uh, and then there's a couple of sort of foundational pieces that, uh, that support the whole the whole effort going forward. So as we think about the, um, the way technology has become sort of integrated into all businesses, but, but certainly the restaurant industry, um, and the need for an effective strategy to collaborate between the IT group that's you know, obviously got a lot of things you're trying to do and you're being asked to do, and the business groups that are either asking for those things or will be ultimately the beneficiaries of, of the changes you're making. Can uh, our panelists talk us through a little bit about how even though these groups may have different priorities and talk different languages, um, how you get them to work together and describe how you sort of keep everybody on the same page and how you're able to bridge the gap between what you know you need to do and what you think you're being asked to do and what the business units think they're, or the business functions think they're asking for and what they ultimately want. Uh, Tammy, let's start with you. Um, well, that's the hardest part of my job. It always is. Um, fixing the technology is actually really easy, in my opinion figuring out what's wrong and where the gaps are and, and what you need to do to make it better. The hardest part is gaining alignment at the executive level because IT um, nowadays uh, always has been to some degree but now even extends into marketing. We're in the middle of every project that has to be done and nobody understands really why if the foundation is old and end of life and unsupportable, why we can't still move quickly with innovative initiatives, and you can't, because we all know that. And so I, I think a couple of things I've done, if I could just share a few tips, is um, anybody who's worked with me knows the first thing I do in trying to explain technology is draw a picture. Because I think when we start, our mouths start moving, everybody in the room, their heads start exploding and they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And now you're saying money and resources and you, I can't have it tomorrow, so explain it to me. So I think a picture really works, simple pictures like this. And um, the, I've recently created something similar that defines what is the tech stack because um, the dependency on infrastructure is extremely critical, and I think we all now know that. For security, for bandwidth, you can't run mobile, you can't deliver mobile um, orders into a store that doesn't have internet, and so then infrastructure becomes extremely important. So I found that, that a visual and, and using repeat terms to describe what this is is helpful. And uh, the second one is, as best you possibly can, uh, provide governance and that is with the stakeholder executives who believe in what you're doing or are really really hungry for and want what you what IT needs to deliver um, you've got to have a governance forum where you bring in front of them the vision repeatedly the vision and the roadmap to get there so you know do an assessment create a three-year roadmap show where the gaps are very clearly again I do that visually as well uh, and then when you're able to show we can't do this because we don't have standard point of sales. We can't do this because we can't do BI because we don't have standard POU numbers. Or we can't deliver um, online ordering because we don't even have you know, uh, stable internet in the stores. Um, I, I think that those are the two things I've found to be the most critical in helping you know, drive change through technology. Thank you. Lou, your thoughts on how you bridge that gap and, and bring the two groups together? Um, I, I agree with, with everything Tammy's saying. I, I mean, governance is extremely important. So um, you, you've got to have you know, your project management office. You've got to have your, your executive steering committee so you get visibility on things. Um, but my approach um, in, in the three different leadership roles that I had at AFC, at Rare, and at, and at uh, Red Lobster have been um, very deliberate. And 
In all three of those situations, I went to work for an executive team that I really had never worked with before. And so the very first thing you have to do as an IT leader is you have got to build credibility um, with what Gartner calls mission one. And mission one is keeping the lights on. If, if you're not able to deliver a reliable um, infrastructure that delivers payroll every week or two weeks, that delivers you know, operating statements and balance sheets every month um, with uh, s solutions in the store that are stable and reliable, um, you're not going to get the opportunity to sit at the table and have credibility with the executives about the strategic things that you need to do. And so very deliberately in all three of those roles, the first two years really was about saying, okay, you're telling me what you want to do. I'm telling you this is how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. And then you deliver on how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. And that doesn't mean that every project comes in on time and on budget. Um, but as you know things are changing, whether to the better or to the worse, you openly communicate constantly. Um, and particularly with the person that I report to, for the first two years um, at, at, at Red Lobster, I was probably in his office five, six times a day. Sometimes it's just to walk by and say, hey, how's it going? Or, it, and with the separation from Darden, as you can imagine, things were happening that we couldn't even plan for. Um, and so just keeping him in the loop, making sure that he had, that he knew I had his back um, and that when I told him how long something was going to take or what it was going to cost, that it, it was credible, that gave me credibility with his peers, the E-team, as well as credibility with my peers. Until you have that credibility with the executive team, you can talk all you want, um, but all they're going to hear is blah, 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 blah. It's a great point. It kind of leads us into our second question, and that is, Given the pace of change and given how relentless the new technology rolling out is or upgrades uh, come out, how do you make long-term decisions in that environment? Lou, since you're already on this topic, you want to you handle that one first? Um, well, I, I, I use my gut a lot of times. Um, long-term decisions in our business right now, and I, I think in any, in any tech business, um, long-term decisions are crapshoots, right? because um, things are changing constantly. Um, so you have to keep up the dialogue. And when I, when I, when I talk about dialogue, I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about cloud. I'm not talking about API bus or containers or firewalls. I mean, those are not the things that I talk to, um, to my peers and, and the senior executive teams about. Um, I'm constantly in, um, involved in conversations around their business. And they're talking about guest counts, they're talking about sales, they're talking about improving, um, improving the cost or the, or the business model, right? So there's only three things that a business does. They either increase revenue, they reduce costs, or they manage risk. So all of my conversations with them are around one of those three topics in some way, shape, or form. How do I, how do I guess the long term? Um, there's several folks in the room here that, that work on my team at Red Lobster. The, the technical stuff, I leave up to the technical engineering staff. Um, you know, put, put really smart guys and gals on your team, give them some direction and where you want to go, and just let them go. Um, so long-term decisions are hard. That's, you know, but in our business, it's all about guest counts and sales, right? It's, it's a pretty simple business. Um, and I, I think that's just, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Annie, additional um, thoughts? Yeah, so long-term decisions, I think, have to start with where are you right now? So um, the first thing I do when I join a company is quickly assess what do we have, where are we? Because you are never going to get ahead if you're already behind. And I'm finding that a lot of companies have been um, disregarding a lot of upgrades and a lot of investments that are now putting them at a very risk point where you can't even adopt the new technologies because you haven't been keeping up with the core. And so I think the first, the first thing is to start with assessing what you, where you are with what you have, and that requires reading contracts. How deep are you in on every contract? When is it going to expire? 
Um, you know, you, you probably find out when you join a company that you, you could be on month to month or, or auto renewing by the year because nobody realized that the, that the contract was expiring. So it's what are the biggest risks and like I said, laying out that roadmap of um, what are the things that need to be dealt with first. I mean, if you have an end of life point of sale system, you're dead in the water. You're really, your first long term decision should be how to get the core of your technology stack in place, which used to, to me, I think everybody agrees it's the point of sale platform because everything feeds in and off of that. But, but my new epiphany over the last few years is it's really the infrastructure. Because if the infrastructure is not stable, um, you're not going to be able to adopt any of the digital uh, initiatives. You, you know, you can't, um, you can't poll data. You, can, you don't have real time. Guests don't have Wi-Fi. Oh my God, what's more important than credit cards these days is the guests are complaining Wi-Fi is not working. I mean, right? You know this. That's more important than anything. So um, I think starting with assessing where you are um, and understanding where you are uh, going to have change moments in your technology roadmap over the next three years and understanding how to get your infrastructure solid. So because the day-to-day -day churn of polling files didn't come in, oh my God, payroll didn't feed, they forgot to do their end of day, that, that, that stuff right there can consume an IT department. Yep. And if you don't deal with some of that to either get with your stakeholders and say, man, can I just get your help? If, 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 if the operators would just do these couple of things, I could free up so much <coughs> IT bandwidth and there's gotta be a partnership there. Um, but that's, that's kind of where I would start on trying to, to build the future. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, staying on the same theme about picking where you're going and, and, and how to get the pieces to work together in a way that you know, really moves the business forward the way you want it to go. Mm -hmm. um, can you think about past projects, current projects you're working on, um, where you think they've really made a meaningful difference to the business, where you've said, that was something we, we decided to do, we executed it, we did it well, and it actually pushed us to that next step of the ladder. Tammy? Um, you know, I think one of the most impactful, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's hurting operations the most I see lately is third-party delivery and the wall of tablets and this lack of integration. And I think the lack of integration, but the need to move at the speed of light is having a negative impact on operations because they just got to pull it off, right? You don't have all of these third-party delivery systems unless you unless you were ahead of the game it are probably not talking to your point of sale but the orders are coming in and it increases revenue and so we just got to do it and so i mean i ran into um and they, he may be here but uh, a f the largest franchisee of hooters and he said heck yeah all day long got the wall of tablets we're doing it and and so the our operators are having to take those orders and then go key them into the point of sale maybe or maybe not because they got paid online so now you're a franchisor and i mean I'm, I'm this is not my idea i was reading it in an article on linkedin is the oh my gosh so if the orders came in online but they never key them through the point of sale then the franchisor doesn't really know how much revenue uh, they're making so there's all these pockets now of of revenue and orders going on and i I feel like the operators get stuck in the yeah. middle of that and until we move really quickly, again, if your infrastructure's right and you got your point of sale partner, um, being able to get that integration in the middle, I think has been become one of the one of the greatest things we're doing for the business is being able to connect it up so they all get back to running the business and they're not rekeying data and yelling orders and mass chaos in the stores. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the integration is one of the kind of more challenging parts for the restaurant industry. When you look at retail, you know, when you look at a, 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 from a vendor's perspective, they're dealing with uh, opportunities with a, a chain of 100, 500 site uh, stores, and they develop a solution, they bring it to market, they sign a deal, and it's 100, 500 stores are going to buy the solutions. The restaurant industry is unique in the sense that it's heavily franchised. And so when a vendor brings a solution to the bear, it's not 100, 500 opportunity is a hundred five hundred hunting license uh, to a large extent and then there's a, it, it moderates the amount of investment that they're willing to put in and so I think what we see is a lot less an order of magnitude less integration uh, in the uh, in the restaurant industry uh, with these a lot of these disparate solutions it's a good point I, on that? well I would say the most significant thing that, that 
that, that's happened in the last two and a half years for us is, is around delivery and online ordering and to go. And um, you know, fortunately, um, through the guidance of, of Tony, uh, sitting over here to my right, who is our uh, enterprise application architect, he came to me and whiteboarded about two and a half years ago and said, you know, we need to start, well, first of all, we, we own our own code for point of sale. So we do our own development for POS and we do most of our own development for back office. Um, we are QSR for KDS, we're QSR for dine time. Um, we use OLO for online ordering. We've got three primaries for um, delivery, which is Grubhub, DoorDash, and Amazon. Um, but Tony came and said, hey, we, we, need to, we need to start opening up the point of sale with web services. I didn't even know what the hell web services were. But he's up there, he's writing like mad. And he's going, if we do this, we can do this, and we can do this, and I said, go make it happen. Um, so, so I would say that to Tim's point, it's not just the franchisees. Um, you know, it's getting, you know, it's getting all the POS vendors in line from a standards perspective. I mean, just, it, it, we don't even have to talk about delivery and online ordering. We, we could just talk about EMV and point-to-point um, and -point encryption and what a headache it is to get the, the, the certified and listed solution uh, for EMV and point-to-point -point encryption to get your POS provider and your device provider and your, your network and your gateway and all these people to, to um, you know, to make sure that everything works, that so you get your piece of paper to hand to, to your yeah. uh, QSA when they come in, so your audit's five days instead of, you know, five months. Um, so I, I do think that there are, there are some boundaries um, that, that, that we deal with um, around vendors. So the most significant thing that, that we did was we basically wrote um, point of sale uh, web services into our point of sale and we invested in, a, in an API bus um, at Amazon Web Services. And that in and of itself, I will not take credit for that brilliant move <laughs> that, was, that was totally led by Tony and, and others on the restaurant systems team. Um, that one thing alone has allowed us to move in three to five month chunks instead of six to 18 month chunks. And um, so if you're, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you what to pick, um, but web services is huge. And when we're sitting across the table from a solution provider and we start talking about integration, and all of a sudden we say, well, you know, we've got this published, um, we've got this API bus, do you, you know, if you can give us your API publication or you guys can write to our pay APIs, and the, and the air lets out of the room. It's like, we'll be done in six weeks. Um, Are you so, selling your point of sale? <laughs> you got a booth? <laughs> Tony got a booth? You know, I, 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 I heard the other day that, that, um, that a formidable competitor in the industry is getting ready to, uh, to, to sell their, their platform as a service. And it made me think that there's maybe some possibility there. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so when you think about it, you know, as you're starting your cloud journey, you're gonna have one cloud application, another cloud application. You can start working with the, the vendors and say, you gotta talk to each other in API. Mm -hmm. Then you go and you get a third application. Okay, the three of you now need to talk to each other. And, and then you get a fourth application. At some point, it's gonna to start to become a little bit messy. And that's when you don't wanna start thinking about uh, a web services and enterprise service architecture where everyone just plugs into the same thing and everybody can then talk to each other. That's actually a great segue, Tim. I'm gonna actually move us over to the next slide. And we kind of dive into sort of what we think of as the major application areas. Again, we're fleshing this out. It's one of the big survey questions that we're asking is help, help fill in the pieces we might be missing. But Tim, do you wanna talk a little bit about the, uh, the work and, and sort of how we're thinking about the different applications and how they apply front of house versus back of house? Yeah, if we maybe just take a step back. The, the purpose of this stack was not so much to define an architecture. Everyone has their own architecture. Really the purpose of the stack was just to facilitate the communication, to be able to have, uh, like as Tammy was alluding to earlier, a, a simple way of talking about things. Um, because if we talk about just what's exciting in the buzzwords, we tend to get tunnel vision, just focus on, okay, I need a mobile app, I need a mobile app, I need mobile ordering, I need, I need delivery, these kind of elements too as well. 
And so the, the purpose of the stack was just to provide a more comprehensive view of the world, saying, let's look at all the different layers. Let's look at all the different pieces. Uh, so the top of the stack is the back of house and front of house. That's where all the decisions made. This is where all the business objectives, as Lou was alluding to earlier, the, the business uh, goals drive, uh, drive IT uh, per, uh, our priorities to a large extent, and how do we start fulfilling them? And so we think about the back of house, but we, we think about it like a restaurateur. We think about it from where all the ingredients come in, and then all the different processes that come to actually delivering that final product that's delivered to the end customer. And then similarly for the front house, well, we start from the uh, engagement with the customer, uh, you know, when they're in their living room, and that fight for their attention, and that fight for their uh, uh, encouragement to come to visit our, our restaurants or to order our food, and all it takes all the way to the point of they're ready to uh, provide the transactions. This was just an easy way to start start the conversation. It's a picture. See, I said a picture. <laughs> oh, picture. <laughs> and, and, a thousand words. And, and, Jim and I've been hanging out. He's been drawing uh, pictures with me. And if you're talking to the board, that's a much too complicated picture. <laughs> 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 they like big circles with three or four words in them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they all have dollar signs on them. Mm -hmm. and so we go back to the we go back to the first picture where you have the uh, just the images and then three little blocks. If and, and, and depending on who you're talking to, maybe you just get three little blocks and and you're going to have to distill it down to that. But, but the idea here now is that now we have a way of at least getting the two groups to look at one thing and be able to understand each other's uh, language. Now, uh, going back to an earlier point, when I work with, I've had the privilege of working with maybe about 100 or so companies. I see, roughly speaking, a two-third, one-third rule. About two-thirds of them, IT is in control of the technology stack. They have to be, because the business executives, to, uh, the marketing, the, the business to a large extent relies on IT to do the job. But in many cases, IT is overwhelmed, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, with just the day-to-day -day of keeping the business running. So about one-third of the companies that I've seen, you have this, the marketing group going shadow IT and going out and just doing their own things. But you don't get something for nothing. As soon as you, anybody can do a, a five-site, ten-site pilot, anybody can do a, a, you know, a proof of concept. It's when you start to scale, and it's, it's when you want to deploy it across an entire system. That governance, that legitimacy, that only comes from IT, and that's where actually that, those, those things fall apart. So either you, you, you take your, your, your lumps up front and actually work with IT and work through the restrictions and the limitations, or you take it on the back end, do your exciting pilots, but then now you have to go through and work through the lumps uh, too as well. And so the, the idea and the, and the hope here is to kind of hopefully facilitate uh, more dialogue, more communication. Um, I would share one story that kind of just really woke me up to, like the amount of conflict that actually happens between these groups. We were talking about uh, guest Wi-Fi and a digital signage type initiative. And th at one point, the uh, uh, CIO basically looked at me and said, do you realize that my Christmas bonus is based on my availability? You know, every, every point of availability is a, 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 another dollar in my wallet. And when you bring in guest Wi-Fi, you bring in video-based training, you bring in digital signage, you compromise the integrity of everything that I'm doing. And my bonus starts coming down. You are literally taking money out of my pocket with every one of these new things that you are doing. And that woke me up to the, to the real sensitivity between the, the different business groups and the potential conflict. And, and being aware of that and being able to navigate that, at the end of the day, the business has to grow. Everybody has to do the same thing. But that magnitude of conflict really woke me up to the, the conflict of interest that exists that needs to be navigated in these systems. Lou, you had a, an interesting sort of uh, framework earlier. So the three things that you needed to do was drive revenue, <coughs> reduce costs, manage risk. Mm -hmm. uh, of those three, is there a place where you, you think, oh, I, I focus my efforts in this area on my risk management, or this part of the business is really all about driving revenue. Is there a front of house piece that says driving revenue takes preeminence, uh, back of house it's all about efficiency and managing costs? Is there, is there some, something you use in, in your thinking of how those apply and where you look to, to find opportunity in your IT portfolio? Well, certainly within the four walls of the restaurant, anything that's guest facing is is hopefully going to be accretive to sales, right? It's 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 either going to um, it's either going to increase your check with the same guest counts, or better yet, it's going to increase guest counts with higher check, right? So your your sales line's going up. Um, you know, from a, a back of the house or front of the house perspective, if you're trying to pull labor, um, you know, in today's world, whether it's um, it's ro let's say it's robotics in the kitchen for um, you know for potato baking or something like that. Or um, if you're trying to look at some guest-facing technology 
um, that gives you know that gives the guest a better frictionless experience, um, but allows you to go from three or four table stations per server to six or eight table stations per server, and you're pulling labor out of the front of the house. I mean, particularly in California and some of these high labor wage states where you're paying $15 an hour now for a tipped employee, um, everybody has to be looking at changing the service model in the front of the house uh, to try to reduce the number of heads in the front of the house. I mean. Even if you reduce the number of heads on the server side by 50%, you're not getting anywhere, you know, six servers at $15 an hour is still a lot more expensive than 12 servers at $250 an hour, right? <laughs> um, so the economics in the front of the house are just way upside down. Um, you know, and, and then the other labor savings is, what, you know, what are, what are we doing around driving, um, um, reducing the administrative burden on, uh, on the manager, right? Taking inventory, orders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So any efficiencies that you can drive in the back of the house um, certainly are, are, um, are gonna be cost-saving type um, efficiencies in the mo for the most part. And your guest facing is gonna be sales. You know, risk, um, you've got the money that you have to spend um, for you know, PII, PCI, EPHI, um, so uh, everything that you do around, uh, around cybersecurity certainly is risk mitigation. And I think the thing that most of us struggle with, in my opinion, from that perspective is how much is enough, right? How much investment in cybersecurity is enough um, to mitigate the risk so that when you're looking at your CEO or you're looking at the board and they're saying, you know, our, our, you know some attack occurs on a, on, a, um, on a sister company or on a, um, on a competitor in the market and all of a sudden they turn around and is what happened to them gonna happen to us, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of my, my thoughts there. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, and the, trying to keep an eye on the clock here, I'm gonna move us forward a little bit to the next slide and talk a little bit about the, the way cloud comes in and, and has really sort of changed some of the, the thinking about what technology you can adopt, how quickly you can adopt it, and, and how you choose to adopt it. Um, I think we've all seen the opportunity that's there. I think people have taken different approaches on how to adopt the cloud and, and, and bring it into their business model. Tammy, can you talk a bit about your, your cloud mm -hmm. journey and, and, and how you think it applies to your, your IT yeah. outlook? So I lived in the era pre-cloud, which some of you did as well, and that was the whole, all that ever really moved was if you had the application that, that opened up the pipe and pushed it or pulled it. So polling or, you know, it was, it was all a very intentional. It was not a, a constant flow, um, which the cloud enabled. And um, I, I think the evolution that, that I've gone through is with some vendors started providing software as a service applications. And I think that changed everything. So this massive bunch of racks of servers that we had to have infrastructure and personnel to manage on-prem or in a, in a colo, um, that began to change probably, t I guess, 10 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago. And it, I think it started with software as a service. So something like a back office system, I think crunch time was the first one that I um, was aware of, that, that the data was up in the cloud, but it also was talking to the system that was running in the store, and so it was really uh, very interactive. So software as a service, I think, was the first place we started, which you don't have to buy the server, and you don't have to install it yourself. It's running um, in the vendor's cloud. And then I think the second step we took was, why don't you put the data in the cloud? So you've got this data sitting in this kind of environment that everybody has to get access to the environment to get access to the data. Why is the data not sitting up uh, in the cloud so that you can, you can drive real-time metrics on mobile apps to your operators and um, vendors that need to talk to your database can get to it because it's in a VM in the cloud. So then we were experimenting with Microsoft Azure and uh, Amazon Web Services for hosting our own database. And then I think the coolest, one of the coolest things was in the last couple of years, uh, last year and a half, we actually did platform as a service. So instead of, again, 
um, investing in um, you know all of the infrastructure in the store with all the hardware investment that's required and and then who's going to monitor it and did you see that the internet circuit went down and did you jump on it fast enough is partnering with a vendor that provides platform as a service so leveraging a vendor that that's what they do is SD WAN and monitoring and circuit management and proactive and we find that a circuit dropped they called and got it up and it failed over to the secondary and no one even knew it. And uh, I think that is a, an excellent use of cloud um, technology to keep us from having such an, an onerous burden in IT because our teams, most of our teams, keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller in IT and yet the, the requirements to move faster and support more is there. The shift is you used to have um, capital investment, buy your servers, buy your licenses, and that came out of, I always called it one checkbook. Yep. And then the monthly recurring was not all that big, but your IT staff was. And now the shift is you're going to a higher monthly recurring on the P&L for the stores because they're paying pay to play, right? It's, it's, mm. it's software as a service, platform as a service, it's recurring, so your capital investment came down. Well. I learned recently that a lot of what you're paying for in that platform as a service or capital lease, and you can capitalize it. So you can balance it back out again. So the monthly recurring being really high on the P&L can get shifted back over where the equipment and the licensing were included. I know I'm getting too deep. We'll, we'll just can that idea, but yeah. anyway, it's worth checking out if you, if you, if you haven't uh, looked into that. I think that's how the cloud is, has moved us forward. Um, most importantly, I think the cloud is enabling guest engagement. And if what's in the, the customer's hand walking in your store, placing an order has to be talking to your point of sale in your kitchen in real time, you just can't do any of that without the cloud because it's too many vendor pieces and too much technology uh, talking. And um, what's really exciting is it, recently we got our vendors around the table to talk about our new point of sale and our mobile app and Grubhub. So we had Aloha, um, Monkey Media, um, and uh, Level Up, and we had all the vendors around the table and we were talking about how do we um, get the API integration to work so tightly that the experience for the customer is in real time talking to what's in the store. Well, guess what? You change the paradigm that, that these systems talk cloud to cloud as opposed to everybody's systems trying to talk to the point of sale in the store, which is too much reaching into all the stores in, in real time. Cloud to cloud and let them talk to their own system is so much more efficient and then eliminates risks, eliminates breakpoints. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Lou, just a, a similar follow-up question, but, but maybe a slightly different perspective. Um, you know, we talk about the cloud, it touches kind of everything that you can do, front of house, back of house, it, it touches other cloud applications. So, so recognizing the, the, the role it's playing across the entire business, do you have a thought on the um, sort of the challenge that poses, uh, you know, some of the downside? Tammy mentioned you know, the, the need to manage lots of interactions and who talks to who and when, but the yep. challenges of going to the cloud and some of the, the, the risks that you have to think or at least consider and yep. how you put the pieces together. Yep. Well, first of all, I'd say none of us are accountants, so whatever she said about the accounting rules, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> please advise your, your, uh, your, your local accountant on that. Um, because cloud accounting is, uh, is an art at, the, at this point. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with everything Tammy said. Um, I, I think that the cloud to cloud communication, the prevalence of the cloud, the move from software as a service all the way to platform as a service um, is, is, is a progression that all of us have gone through, some of us quicker than others, um, some of us are still in the middle of the journey. Um, and the thing that I like about cloud is that it takes the utility of IT that I talked about as an IBM or 20 years ago and actually makes it a reality to the point where just like you can plug a lamp into a wall socket and you know when you flip the switch it's going to turn on that you can plug into a wall socket and you're getting HR payroll services or you're getting infrastructure services or you're getting network or or sock services um, you know that's all well and good but you know the the, the complication is the security and management of all of those clouds and the capabilities of each of those business partners because the reliability of their infrastructure um, 
now Im influences the reliability of your total infrastructure. The management of that infrastructure um, depends on their capabilities. Um, the security of the data that's flying around between all these APIs and the dupli duplicative nature of the data, um, the complication, you know, we talked about GDPR yesterday um, a little bit, uh, but whether it's GDPR or, um, or uh, whether it's HIPAA or uh, PCI or, or, or whatever, um, the, the governance of this heterogeneous distributed cloud environment um, and the security of it is, is the challenge. Thank you. And I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> it's a risk. You know, the, the cloud provides exciting opportunities to very quickly try a whole lot of new things. Yeah. Um, the, one of the challenges, though, I think that often gets overlooked, though, is you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And uh, when it comes to the cloud applications, well, they're always dependent on access to the internet. Yeah. You lose your network connection, you lose your applications. Yep. You lose your mobile orders. I mean, there are things in the restaurant that are very good at handling outages. Mm -hmm. Credit cards can still go on offline but mobile orders cannot. And, and when you think about it, you've not only lost all those mobile orders that you could have had, you've also lost all those future mobile orders because those customers went somewhere else to get their order fulfilled. And so when we think about the cloud, uh, you know, it's it very quickly questions about now availability, reliability. The other paradigm change that we also want to think about is so many of the cloud providers have adopted an agile mentality. You know, they're out there to give a minimum viable product to throw out there. So we're not dealing with you know, a once a quarter or once or twice a year kind of updates. We're dealing with weekly updates. And so those updates become very intrusive and interfering to your ability to actually run your business when you're trying to do, you get a software update and you're in the middle of you know, a rush hour and it starts to, uh, starts to congest up your point of sale transactions too as well. Yeah. So, I, so I highly recommend if you look at a platform as a service or if you don't, you just do your own networking model to have two internet connections if it's not too hard circuits, uh, because sometimes a lot of um, locations actually don't have two carriers that can get last mile to your building, at least have a 4G as a secondary failover, because believe it or not, you can pretty much run your business on a 4G these Absolutely. days, and they don't even know the difference, and when online orders can't get in because you had one internet connection and it went down, or I think you're gonna ask about VoIP phones, that's really bad, I had internet orders, and I have VoIP phones, and I have one internet connection, and it's down. So not only can the order not get in, but nobody can call the store and say, oh my God, you know, you got 20 customers heading your way because they just placed online orders that, by the way, didn't get injected into the, to the point of sale. So I, I'd highly recommend looking at two. Well, you got all the happy scenarios today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in IT, it's all about reality. Well, i tell you what, I, I know we're almost to the end here, so I'm gonna, actually gonna move past the next slide or two fairly quickly. I do wanna interject one thing real quick. Ar around the cloud security, um, one thing that my security team did do was um, they established a great relationship with our contract attorney. And so every contract, whether it comes through IT or, it, or not, particularly for cloud services, lands on his desk. As soon as he sees one, he calls, uh, he, he calls my uh, CISO and we've got a uh, security assessment and an architecture assessment that happens in parallel with the contract negotiation. Um, so that if there are weaknesses in that environment based on our assessment, we can, we can, uh, we can address those in the contract. That, that's fantastic. I was actually going to the security slide anyway. So that was, oh, there you that, go. That fit right in there. That, that's perfect. Get out of my head. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it when you, you make the segue for me. It makes yeah. it easy for me. Um, Tim, did you... I, I know you wanted to talk about security very quickly as well. Did you want to bring up the... If, if we just look at the trends and kind of where the market has moved, you know, there was uh, last year, past a few years, we, a lot, a lot of discussion about PCI compliance. That's kind of been there, kind of gone its way. And now as we start thinking moving forward, you know, security just continues to evolve, right? And so I think everyone's understanding now that PCI, PCI compliance in and of itself is not enough. Uh, the security threats continue to evolve, and we need uh, solutions and investments in place as resources in place to keep up with those. And so the, the, the quick thing about security is it's not just a checkbox to get uh, make sure that you're, you're covered uh, in the event of a breach. It's how do you invest, in a, as Lou was actually mentioning a little bit earlier, how do you invest enough uh, that you've, uh, how much is enough in terms of being able to have a reasonable care, a reasonable level of security uh, so that if, when, the breach happens, uh, you can actually demonstrate that you know appropriate actions were taken. 
And this just unfortunately happened. <laughs> thought that was negative. That was negative. Yeah, well, it was the security slide. We're supposed yeah. to say some bad things about the sky falling. Um, we've already talked a fair bit about digital infrastructure. I think you know, we certainly appreciate the comments about the one, being able to run a business on a 4G if you have to and, and, and having a secondary line. But you raised a good point, Tammy, about you know, I've got internet orders coming in. Maybe I've gone to VoIP. I, right, my phone system might be impacted by that. So can you talk a little bit about that challenge of how do you manage an environment where You've had you know, consistent mid-double-digit growth and bandwidth utilization year over year for the last four or five years, and an environment where you're adding new tech, new devices, mm -hmm. new applications all the time. How do you get the infrastructure so that it's not so far out in front that you're, right, you're not using it, but that you're not leapfrogging it, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation where you've, you've kind of backed yourself into a corner and you don't have the infrastructure you need for your next your next step. Yep. Well, hire a really smart infrastructure guy, which is what <laughs> I did at La Madeline, uh, and he knew his stuff. And he came in, and he, we, we looked at how many POTS lines. So if any, do you guys look at what the POTS lines are costing and the growing tariffs on those? And I, I, from what I'm hearing from the telecom companies, they don't want to do POTS anymore. They want you off of them. So they're jacking the prices up so high that you'll quit using them. And so your, your ROI to eliminate all of the, the, the POTS lines into your store and go with everything digital is pretty compelling. And um, we were about to invest in just a myriad of disparate so, uh, initiatives to add a wi -Fi, add another DSL circuit to get Wi-Fi into one brand because we had eight brands. And this one was going to do, I, it was just all over the board. And, um, my head of infrastructure said, why don't we look at an SD-WAN um, all-included solution? And what we found was for what we were paying for our current frame relay, we could actually get a 300 meg uh, SD-WAN circuit into the store and the full platform as a service. So I, I think if you don't have enough bandwidth and you're struggling with old T1s and old, um, you know, uh, private MPLS networks, uh, you, you really should take, find a good telecom partner and take a look at what's available right now because you could just be sitting there running on a one and a half, a half meg um, like little bitty straw and you could have a whopping 30 to 300 meg pipe for the same price. Or less. Or less. Yeah. Yes. I, I would echo that. If you're still on legacy telecommunications going into your restaurants, which which includes T1 networks, um, it doesn't matter what size company you are or how much money you're going to invest. I will tell you that you're probably going to see two to three times the savings of whatever it is that you invest, and you're going to see it in a year or less. So if you're not looking at that, you better be looking. At it. <laughs> Thank you. I think when it comes to infrastructure design, you also want to think about the scenarios where not only can you get, usually when we uh, look at uh, in, in the work that we've done, generally speaking, you're looking at about maybe 70, 80 percent of the locations can get an adequate amount of capacity. There's still a meaningful chunk though, 30, 40 percent that may get stuck uh, in just all you can get is a low speed connection. Mm -hmm. And so whatever digital initiatives that you're thinking about planning, you want to anticipate for that and be prepared for saying, how am I going to make these sites, because uh, there's still a meaningful part of my, my, my brand, there's still a meaningful part of my brand and customers come here and they don't know the high speed experience versus the low speed experience. How do those customers still get an adequate experience with the brand even when they don't have the Wampin 300 meg pipe? And so the design and the approach needs to encompass the speeds that get Google Fiber, but also the speeds that, uh, also the, the restaurants that mm -hmm. do not. Yeah. Uh, so we're at the end of this, uh, this portion of, of, uh, of this session. We're kind of at the end of the time, but I did want to leave a, a moment at the end for any questions or a couple of, take a couple from the floor if anybody has any questions. Nobody's got the first question. We're sure. Oh. Thank you. Um, That's because Tim is up here. He usually <laughs> asks those questions. <laughs> you talked about the experience with, like, a, like you said, with franchise locations, how you've been able to get them standardized like, yep. to go along with the initiative of what you're trying to do. Well, I'll tell you, this was uh, my first time to bring forth a, an architecture and a strategy that said it all starts with infrastructure. And the very first reaction from the CEO was, hell no. <laughs> You're not messing with franchisees' infrastructure. We're, we can't do that because then, you know, what are we liable for and all of that? And I said, well, here's the deal. They call our help desk anyway. 
And when they call our help desk, we have no idea how their network is constructed, what's plugged in where, you know. And so then we're on the phone with them twice as long, and it's still our fault. So we would be better off to propose to them. And then I talk to one of them, and they're like, yeah, I don't know. My son ran the network. He doesn't know what he's doing anyway. <laughs> and they don't, they don't want to do it. I mean, they want a, a reason. They want good, a good cost point, a price point. But they really don't want to. They're not network engineers. And a really large franchisee. I'm sure do have their own um, IT departments with network but the way that we sold it was the very simple stack and it said if this is why the infrastructure layer is critical it's Wi-Fi it's PCI it's security this is why your back office and your POS is critical this is because those two layers enable digital and you want digital that's that's the carrot everybody wants digital if you want to get there you've got to do these two things and I'll tell you for dealing with franchisees and I don't mean to offend any franchisees franchisees that are in the room, but some franchise agreements are written so old that the brands had no, they had no vision that technology would be as core to their business as the food and the branding. And now I think all the brands know that and they are trying feverishly to replace those old franchise agreements that say this, this tech kit, it's, it's all that stuff. And I think the infrastructure should be in it. So we reached out to one of our franchisees and said, hey, you know, we're rolling out this platform as a service and they were our largest franchisee. And they looked at the cost point and they looked at what they were already spending and they're like, bring it. And we were halfway through rolling it out before Op Services says, they're never going to buy that. And we're like, uh, we're almost done with the rollout. And they're <laughs> loving it. <laughs> so. I love it. IT, IT is a revenue stream. I love it. Uh, uh, yeah. I would just questions? add that uh, technology oh, has become so important that um, it's really remarkable that I'm starting to see more and more franchise brands start to rethink the idea that it's, it's the franchisee's choice as to what they're going to get. And they're actually reconsidering uh, th that fundamental tenet that says, this is too important for us to, to leave up to the franchisee, uh, and we're going to make the decision now. That's kind of how we've been feeling lately. You know, we're trying to push it towards, like, you know, our name's on your door. That's right. That's right. You, yeah. That's not you, so. Well, it starts with the franchise agreement. So if it's not written that yeah. that's a part of it, then you know they yeah. they can do their own thing. And some large franchisees, I think the 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 uh, the balance is point of sale is core, and you can't roll anything out if you don't have the standard point of sale, standard PLUs, um, standard network. Back office, I think, is still up for debate. Um, I think Ops Excellence, when they try to say help a brand, uh, help a franchisee be successful and make the most, if you're using the back office, then you've got a, did you schedule? Are, are you using our scheduling capabilities? Are you using our forecasted ordering? I mean, the back office is where you actually man manage margin. And if you, if you don't have a standard one of those, then I, I mean, I can't teach you that dance because I don't know that dance you're doing. So um, I, I think it's, but the other ones are, are really core. I think infrastructure and point of sale, I think are really core. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Is anybody, one last question time for? Uh, all right, I'll leave you with one last thought then on the, uh, the, the, the program we're doing. Tim, you want to talk a bit about the survey that's out there? And uh, this is the beginning. Uh, so we are uh, working with uh, Fran Data, and I invite you all to uh, grab this link, or we'll send it out to you uh, in email. But the idea is that this is the this starting point. We want to continue this dialogue and this conversation of trying to understand how is the restaurant technology stack changing. Uh, and so I invite you to uh, kind of participate in this, and uh, uh, we'll obviously share the results uh, with all of you who participate. But the whole idea is to get a greater and greater understanding of what's going on, uh, what's important, what types of technologies are starting to become mainstream, and to also be able to kind of start to benchmark kind of, kind of where is the industry at, and then as an indiv each individual restaurateur, kind of how do I compare uh, to what my peers are doing. Thank you, Tim. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I apologize we went a few minutes over, but I hope it was worth it. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Lou. Hope you guys have a great show. <laughs>